All right, so it's now being recorded. And by continuing to be in this meeting, you're consenting to be recorded. So welcome everyone to our module one webinar for Data 460 and your section 6380. Okay, uh, as soon as my screen starts working here. Okay, oops. Okay, well, I think we have a small crowd again, so I don't have to really go through all the etiquettes again, but the only thing I would stress on is if there's, um, if, if you have any distractions around you, so please mute your microphone. Feel free to be on the camera, guys, absolutely. You know, you don't um, really, um, you don't have to, since you know, we have a small crowd, um, you, you can be up on the camera. You can put your, you know, you can unmute your microphone as well. Only there's some disturbance around that you can go back on mute. Okay, and again, um, this session, I'll try to keep it within the hour, um, but you know, I have a tendency to jinx it at times, um, but I will definitely will not cross beyond an hour, 15 minutes or so. Okay, so the agenda that I have for you guys today, um, so we'll go over NLP, try to keep away or steer away from anything that you may have already read. And I know there's a lot of material that you guys went through, but I still want to touch upon some basics uh, as a, you can take that as a refresher. And, uh, you know, there'll be something to uh, uh, supplement as well. So there would be uh, some add-on as well um, that you'll find during this webinar. Uh, we'll talk about assignment one, of course. Um, this is the very first assignment. Um, for your course, so we'll certainly talk about that and take any questions that you may have. And, and finally, I'll take in any other questions that you may have um, for module one, for the course, for anything that you may have in mind. Okay, so with that, and before I go on to talking about NLP, um, just a quick retrospective on how the first week was, right? Um, again, it was one of the most exciting discussion weeks that I've seen in re recent times. And, and trust me, I, I know I, I, I'm going to be very honest with you. I, I said this to the previous class as well, but um, what you've done is you guys are taking it to the next level. You you are all hitting to the gold standard that I'm, I'm really looking for, that you should all be striving for um, being in a 400 series class. And I'm already seeing that. So you, you are taking one step up um, from the previous class where I thought they were doing very well. They had a very great, good start. Uh, and of course, at the end it with, you know, hitting the gold standard. And many of you are already right there hitting the gold standard. So keep up the good work. Again, don't lose momentum at all. Um, love the fact that you all embrace the spirit of engagement and participation, you know, by reviewing your classmates postings and asking some good questions. And as I always say, we all have an opportunity as a class to do better, you know, hit that gold standard, just raise the bar, raise the ceiling, hit the ceiling, right? And take advantage of these webinars. So thank you all for who are here today. And for folks, uh, you know, who are not going to be able to join in or to these webinars, please make sure you're watching this recording. So if you're watching this recording today, I would and I would uh, definitely encourage you to be in person so that you can ask your questions, take advantage of the fact that you're going to be here with your other classmates, um, ask your questions in person. But if you cannot make it, completely understand. Um, but, you know, spend them some, spend some time after the recording is up um, to, to go over it and see if uh, some of the questions that you may have have been addressed during this session or these sessions, these webinars, okay? So with that, let, let's get into talking about language, right, in general. So as far as human beings are concerned, we humans with language, we are good at, at certain aspects of language. First and foremost, we are good with ambiguity, right? We, we, and what I mean here is we are pretty good with filling, filling in the blanks. For example, if you want to, you know, say something, you maybe, maybe you'll just not finish the entire sentence sometimes and just say a few words of the sentence and the, the person 
would really know what you're talking about, right? We could be ambiguous at times. We could because we have other things that we have. You know, we can make use of some facial expressions, or you know, we 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 have this uh, sign. Um, you know, you was using your hands. We can you know make some signs that we can use along with the language that we it's it's easier for the other person to fill in what you may not be saying it loud, right? So we are pretty good with, with that ambiguity. We're also good with creativity. So if you if you go around, we, we are so good with, um, you know, the way if you're talking with amongst friends in school, in college, um, you know, we, we, we come up with different phrases, we come up with slang, we come up with how we twist words and the way we, we uh, speak at home and sometimes with our own family members. Um, we have some some code words, some code phrases, so on. So we, we are so creative with that. And we're pretty good. I, I think every every generation comes with its own version of, um, you know, a slang or or the way that the, the language is spoken. So we're pretty good with uh, with creativity. We are also good with common knowledge. For example, if I have to say that, hey, I need butter, um, you know, can you please get me butter? Maybe I don't have to go on and tell you if you're within in the house, maybe what I mean is, you know, go get me the butter on, on the kitchen table or from the fridge, right? So it's, you apply some common knowledge to what you're hearing or what is being spoken to you um, and, and, and you react accordingly. So humans, again, are, are good with, with that common knowledge. Um, you know, we, we know some of the surrounding based on what the person is talking about, it's easily to grasp that, add that quickly and make sense out of it. As I said, I could just say again, it's also about filling the blanks, ambiguity. I'm asking you to get the butter. I may not tell you from where, but you would probably know, right? So you're doing both, ambigu filling in, I mean, the ambiguity part, uh, you're filling the blanks, you're also applying the common knowledge. We are also good with diversity. The way we speak to you know people within our family, to our friends, to coworkers, to classmates and peers, um, you know, to uh, to everyone, to depending on the crowd around us, depending on the type of people around us, you know, we know our 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 definitely our our tone of the like our tone, our language, the choice of words changes so much, right? We, we know how to change it based on who we are talking to. So we are good with that diversity. We are good with empathy as well. Again, our tone can be, we change our tone based on, you know, we, we know how to empathize, um, you know, with people on certain situations, you know, based on what you hear, uh, you would have a different kind of a tone or you'd use different choice of words based on if you if you find out somebody is going through a, a very tragic situation, you know how would you would empathize and what what would be the, your choice of words. So we are good with empathy. We're good with analogies. So um, we we are in case if we have to you know, if you're explaining something and the other person is not able to get it we can use certain analogies. We are good with that, right? We'll find out how we can make this person under, uh, understand what you're trying to say. For example, you know, uh, and I, I, this is a very classic example, which is also one of the uh, you know, top interview questions, um, you know, especially for computer science and that kind of interviews and um, is how do we explain database to a five-year-old, right? You cannot just, use the definition or, or, or use all technical jargons to explain what a database is to a five-year-old. You'll come up with some analogies, right? You'd say, hey, you know, you have a cupboard, you have, you know, you know where you have different drawers or shelves within this cupboard, you know where you put your shirts in one, um, your pants in other, and your, your, you know, sweaters and so on and so forth. You will explain the child using that analogy. Um, so we, we are good with that as well. We're good with storytelling. We know how to weave a story. If you had to do certain presentation, we know how you would want to kind of build that presentation, build the slides, build that story um, so that it's going to be interesting to your audience. We are pretty good with storytelling. 
what we may not be good at and we are not is are not so good at our speed is speed right speed of reading or writing or comprehending yes we can read fast there are many who can read very fast but there's still there's a limitation on how fast you can go we can write fast get, depends on there's some limitation again that will be you know driving it and you can only write fast so much comprehending you can hear someone who's is a very fast speaker but the the amount of uh, like how much you can comprehend is is going to be limited there's going to be some limitation if you if the the person goes too fast or if you are watching something or he listening to something that goes in too fast you'll not be able to comprehend if you start to read a book and and you read at double triple the speed at the end of the you know if you end of the page that you would have read you would not probably know what you've read you will have to probably read it again right there is some limitation to that what we are also not good at is multiple languages yes we there are many who can speak and 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 multiple languages and understand read or write many languages and there's some limitation there's a finite number maybe single digits maybe few of them would go into double digits very few triple digits i haven't heard any but if there's anyone out there knowing hundreds of languages or maybe even more than 100 well definitely that that guy must be uh, or that person must be uh, definitely someone who is the best in languages but okay, how many do we find right so we have limitation we we would probably not see many with triple digit kind of number of languages that we know so uh, there's some limitation on that limitation on linguistic power depending on what uh, the type of work we do or how we are, we use um, you know what we speak day in and day out to the type of crowd, to the type of people we speak, whether we are part of academia, whether you're part of somewhere, or you are, you know, you're working on, you're having a job where you are doing a lot of communication with the clients, your choice of words would be depending on that, right? If there are, if if you do not use certain words for a period of time, they just fade out. They just fade out of your dictionary. They are no longer part of your vocabulary, right? So linguistic power depends on how or how much you are speaking day in and day out and to the type of you know people that you're speaking to day in and day out your generative abilities uh, the quick translation how fast and how much can you translate if you know multiple languages yes you may be able to translate again there's finite number of languages you would know there's finite number of you know there's or there's you know the speed of translation could also be um, you know, you'd be limited to how fast you can translate it, right? So again, human beings, when it comes to speed, reading, writing, comprehending, understanding multiple languages, vocabulary, remembering all the words that you've learned, you know, over the years, can you remember it all? Depends on if you have been using it all, all your life, which is rare, but can be, it's possible, but still it, it depends on how much you've been using it, how much you've read, how much you've used all along. And, and of course, the translation, the speed of translation is also going to be questionable. So this is these are the times when we think of, hey, would there be someone who could do this better, right? Um, you know, there would be a, a, an intelligent system or a system that can really increase your speed, your knowing knowledge of language, knowledge of multiple language, translation that's when you think about this intelligent systems right your natural language systems so what is natural where does natural language processing stand right when you talk about ai i've just taken this picture from um and this is part of your reading material that you have gone through and this is part of the i think the the one of the chapters within the o'reilly books that was uh, your week one reading. So I, I just, you know, did steal this uh, you know, chart from there. If I'm, by the way, again, as I mentioned last uh, last time as well, if I'm using any sources, any pictures, 
I would be also providing the source to it. I would be providing a link to it. So you don't have to take a snapshot. It will all be in a part of the deck. It will be there, the link as well. And the reason I, I provide links to what I could be talking here and because it will not be able to do justice and, and talk more in details. I would, I would like you all to go through this, especially if you have not gone through some of the links that I presented here, if you have not been part of your reading uh, during the week, then I suggest, I strongly suggest and recommend that you go through them and, and, and read this little more, right? To get into the depth of what we could be discussing here, okay? So coming to this picture here, artificial intelligence, you would not believe, but this word was coined way back in 1940s and late 40s and 50s, right? It's not new. And, and the time when artificial intelligence, the word was coined, it also, you know, that, that was also the time when the seeds of NLP were planted. Because if you're talking about intelligent systems, then <clears throat> intelligence is also about comprehending, right? Understanding language, processing the language, right? NLU, natural language understanding, natural language processing, comprehending. It's all part of that NLP. So it was right then that it was born. So everything is years and years back that we, so everything is, so AI is definitely, you could call it as, as the big bubble there. And, and within it are your machine learning. You have NLP. Machine learning are all the, the suite of algorithms, you have NLP, all the natural language processing tasks, and that you would be, you know, that's all part of NLP. You have the um, deep learning, that is, you know, um, all the neural networks that you would apply with multiple layers and, 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 and multiple parameters where it forms deep learning. So it's just showing you, it's just giving you a good perspective of where each of these terms stand, right? Where's, where's AI, where's NLP, where's ML? So just, just wanted to bring this up again as a good starting point of where or where, what is natural language processing? Where does it stand, right? How do you relate that with AI? So talking about the, you know, going from there to the history of NLP models, where does it all start? Again, it starts way back in, in many, many years in 1950s when we started off with rule-based and heuristic-based models. You had certain linguistic rules and patterns to extract information and based on that, make some decision-making, right? So there were some rule-based systems that we started building. So it, it started off there. We then had some statistical models, right? We had the hidden Markov models that would kind of look at the, the language or the, the text underneath, like the, the grammar behind the text and then the n-grams, like building the, uh, um, you know, the combination of words, like two words, how many times these combination of words have been repeated, right? Whether it's two words or three words and four words. And that would help not just the frequency, but it would help to build or, or generate what would be the next word in the sequence. So if you're thinking about, hey, this was all, you know, the, the seeds were planted way, way back. Not that we did not know what we are doing, so what we are seeing today, um, all that with the with the latest uh, tools and, and techniques, you know, to uh, to get to the next word. The the seeds were sown and planted many many years back. It was right there. Then came the machine learning models, right? You talk about naive base for text classification. You had the support vector machines. Um, we had the uh, the recurrent neural networks, right? which is in more mostly in the sequential sequential form where the output of one neural you know one neural output is 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 becomes the input for the other in the sequence is going from left to right one of the limitations of the uh, recurrent neural networks again they were they were pretty good for languages because sentences we read from left to right and and so they were really good it was a good model for the, the language processing or text processing, but the one of the drawbacks of the recurrent neural networks was that once it is going from sequence to sequence, you know, feeding from free, feeding one output and, and becoming an out input to another and going on, 
it would it would lose track of where it all started right so it would not be able to retain or, or keep in memory where it started right so that's when the the long short term memory re recurrent neural networks came into play where you know it was able to have that additional power to retain the memory as to where it all started this was also the time when sentiment analysis got introduced or more text classification methods got introduced here um and then this was the time like you know 80s and 90s and and of course when when the uh, especially when the the social media you know came into play and we had all that ex additional text and big data coming into play that these uh, technique techniques like sentiment analysis and text classification became so important and so heavily used at that point what changed and revolutionized this in the last few years is the transformer architecture, right? The architecture which was not processing sequentially, but processing text in a parallel form. So it wasn't. It was not just the parallel computing uh, that was in play, but also the the uh, the architecture of these models that were you know parallelly processing data. So that kind of led to what we are seeing today: the large language models like GPT, right? And 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 they and of course it is leading to so many of generative AI multi models and uh, so yes this is this has revolutionized this whole thing so what you have seen you know is happening during the last few years very exciting phase right especially for natural language processing and and you're seeing that you're right in the middle of it you're you're seeing GPT you're see, using probably Chat GPT and and so on. You're seeing so many AI tools, um, but again, if you if you think about, look at oh, many of those AI tools. A, they, a lot of these models NLP based because they want to understand what you're asking, what you're telling it to do, and based on that, it does it. So there's NLP into play. There's also multi-model, multi-modal, um, you know, uh, models into play where you know it's not just about processing text. It is about processing text and audios and video and everything put together, right? The multimodal. So this is this is what it, it's an exciting era now because of the the computing, the type, the computing architecture that has changed. And you know, going from where how you know the the computers in the past to computers of today, it has you know it's been revolutionary and how it has changed, and also the the model and and these different techniques. Um, that have changed and the the architecture of the models that has led to what we are seeing today. Okay, so this is in in brief the history of um, you know NLP. Now, where are we with NLP? Right, to thinking about all the different tasks within NLP, um, you know, there's spell checking, right? Just checking this, checking this, the whatever the text is. You check the spelling. You you have you can retrieve. You know, based on the keyword, retrieve a certain word or a set of words within text, topic modeling, some of the easier tasks of NLP. We kind of have grown over the last many, many years doing this. Then came the text classification, um, information extraction, not just, you know, per certain words or, send or group of words, but even beyond that. Um, we, we also probably the medium task have been the closed domain conversational agent, meaning you know, in a certain the the conversation agents or the bots or the chat bots for you know a particular domain area. So you you would train a bot based on certain conversation, right? Certain dialogues that could be used or or heavily used within a particular domain area. And it's this this bots are specific to a particular domain area. You could not just be asking it anything. A travel bot would only respond to mostly about traveling and helping you with that rather than going and, and doing other things, right? Like chat GPT is a more of a general, general and open domain kind of a conversational agent. So the, the medium you know, task was to do it for a domain. So what we are is, is pretty much in, in this particular zone right now. We are more into, we saw many tools that are in play today that, that summarizes any text given to it. You give a PDF, you give a Word document, you give a, 
you know, a big, large corpus, and it would summarize it for you very quickly. Um, you know, question answering, we see many tools that are, again, for a particular domain or, you know, more, or a larger domain area, it can, you know, once you feed in a certain information, you can answer and ask all different types of questions to that information. Translation, right? Um, translating any of the text that in, in, in multiple languages, you know, could easily be done. Um, you could also, we have gone to a point where not the, the bot may not be, or a chat bot may not be just, uh, you know, for restricted to a particular domain, but an open domain where you would not just have a corpus of a certain domain area, but a corpus of text of multiple domain areas that is going to help you kind of build that kind of an open domain conversational agent. So we are, we are in, in terms of, uh, you know, relative difficulty, we are at all these different tasks that were that are considered difficult tasks. We are at that point. We are able to do all that because of the you know how things have changed you know from computing standpoint as, as also from not just the hardware architecture but also the the machine learning algorithms and and the and the model architectures that have changed over the years that has helped us to get to where we are today with NLP, okay? I know I've done a lot of talk in the last few slides, so folks, let me let me pause here and ask if there are any questions. I hope you guys are still tracking. Okay, should I take the silence as yes? Okay, all righty. Okay, so change of gears. So we, you learned about all different techniques in text processing. So here's a visual of, um, you know, it, it, it taking a text through different stages of techniques. Like you, you learned all these techniques of, you know, uh, changing the text to lowercase or changing the text to, or removing the punctuations or removing the stop words and, and, and stemming and lemmatizing and, does that mean that you go and apply to every text data that you get? Like you have a project for a text data that you just go simply apply all these techniques? And, and this addresses that, this answers that question, right? So what this, what this has done again, they've taken two different techniques here. They have come, they're using a knife base and a fast text for you know, text classification and what they're doing so on, on the on the on the vertical axis is the F1 score, the performance of the model, and what it is doing is is for each of these techniques, it is measuring performance after every stage of that that when the data is taken through. So, for example, when you know the first stage for the first one, it says it takes the text and it converts into all lowercase. That's all it does. And it, it 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 creates a model. The performance of that model, like if you can see the blue line, which is knife base, you see that it is maybe around 0.6. Whereas if you take the fast text, it is already pretty high, maybe at 0.78 or so. So that's when you just converted the text into lowercase. Then it took the text and it applied it removed the punctuation from the text and then check the performance of the model after that. As far as knife base goes, there wasn't a big difference. It probably stayed flat. As you can see, the blue line is just stayed flat. Yes, it, with the fast text, yes, there was some performance enhancement there. It went almost from 0.78 to maybe 0.81 or 0.82. So it, just, it did improve on, right? Then, after that, the third step, the third stage or the third step, it it took the text, it it uh, converted into lowercase, it it removed the punctuation, it removed the stop words, the and as far as the um, knife base goes, the the performance of that knife base model technique, yes, that performance did increase a bit. So there was an enhancement there. Fast text. There was still better. It it still was much better, and it it went ahead and and gave a better performance. So now to the next step, 
it besides you know converting into lower case removing punctuations removing stop words it did add stemming look what happened to the models both the the model types both these techniques led to a decrease a decline in performance it just crashed almost if you look at the knife base the blue line it just came from it had probably reached around 0.6867 it just crashed back to almost 0.5. Same thing happened with fast text. Well, relatively, it, it did crash. It did come down. Um, and, and so you could see that the stemming was really not a good idea there. Again, so the next phase, it removed stemming and it did apply lemmatization, right? So when it applied lemmatization, the performance did increase gradually. But if you see the performance of after the lemmatization is applied, pretty pretty similar to when we the when we were in the third step, which was you know lower uh, changing to low, uh, uh, converting to lowercase, removing punctuations and removing stop words. So it was as if stemming and and lemmatization had had no had really no impact or effect on your modeling or no in fact to your performance. It did not improve performance. So what is this saying? That stemming and lemmatization is good? No, far from it, right? This is, this is one exercise or one you know, um, study based on the data set on hand. What this is actually showing and the reason for me bringing this up here is, is just saying that when you are when you are building models, when you're running these different techniques, when you, you just don't apply all these techniques and say, oh, just because I know all these techniques for text processing, that I'm go just going to run all these different techniques. As a matter of fact, what you would want to do is, you know, run through different, you know, steps, phases of this, right? At every step, see what kind of a performance you're getting. What is your base performance with the text? How with different applying different techniques is is it really helping your model or is it not helping your model at all? Right. So you want to really and, and this again it's not uh, saying stemming is is not right or maybe stop words removing stop words is always good and removing punctuation is always good. It depends. Depends on the data. Depends on the technique that you're using. There's so many different factors here that. So the, the, the main thing, the main takeaway from this chart or from this slide is that go have a base, base model and then apply different techniques and check your model performance after these techniques, okay? All right, so moving on, just want to talk about some of the, um, you know, and very interesting NLP startups. And, uh, you know, I put up the, the source as well. So you'll be able to, read about some of the startups that I would have on this slide. In addition, there are a few more that are on that, um, on that article, um, which is kind of listed here. So one of the interesting ones is Clevu. It is an, uh, it's an instant site search solution for e-commerce stores. So it's an interesting search, like based on what you're looking for as a, basically you could be looking for a product and you provide some more information about the product, like what price you're looking for, what type you're looking for, and it takes in some more information. Then it's it's not a simple search. You could say, well, I could just search it on Google and it will tell me where all, all different stores I can buy, and Amazon, it could say which are other eBay or, or, or Walmart or whatever. Yes, it does that, but this takes it to the next level with based on, your, you know, what your requirements are for a product or what you're really looking for, a particular price, a particular type, a particular brand, it takes all that into account and then comes up with a, with a nice search, you know, um, a result which showing you all the different online or e-commerce stores that is going to provide you that product and, and the most competitive ones. So it has really taken it to the next level, again, taking in, into account your requirement, your input, and it is it is take it's keeping the, your your requirement in mind when it is doing this search. So, again, something to take a look at. Um, Desti is another um, NLP startup which has taken the searching and and planning travel 
It's not new. Uh, we have multiple websites out there that does this for you, that looks for different, you know, uh, travel, um, you know, traveling um, options you can have and prices and all that. This is taking into account um, your liking, like what you like. You like to travel by train. You like to travel by air. You would not want to do this. You would have a certain budget in mind. So it takes into consideration all these different aspects of what you're providing and it builds that itinerary based on that. So again, it is taking that next, it go, goes to the next level by understanding what you need and, and how you'd want this travel to be, uh, this itinerary to be built. Yumly is another website um, which is based on your interest, your liking about the food, the type of food that you eat at times, at different times of the day, the different days of the week, it will come up with uh, ideas for you to, you know, what you may want to eat at certain time and where you would get that. It, it, it will just do that. Again, a very interesting uh, website that you would want to take a look at. There's another NLP startup called Insight Engines that builds intelligent search assistance to search data within your organization. So you would have multiple places where your data could be for your organization, as long as it gets access to this corpus of data across the, uh, the different departments of your organization, you could have a search assistant that's going to search anything for you within the company and, and, and present it to you. It's wonderful. Again, uh, it, it, it's uh, something to, um, to look at and it's very interesting. Next one is Iribon which takes unstructured data like emails, instant messages, and social media to provide structured answers. So it, it just takes it, it reads all these, uh, it builds a corpus of all the emails and AIM and social media postings and all of that to provide some structured answers um, based on that, right? If you ask questions, hey, who posted this when, or what was being discussed, or what was the main topic, or who was the, the main uh, presenter of these topics, whatever, whatever question you would want to um, you know, be answered. MindMel is another interesting startup that builds intelligent conversational interfaces for any applications or devices, right? A very interesting one. And the last one here, Engine, is designed to give you direct answer based on internet search. So, it takes the Google search to next level, where Google search with based on your keywords, it will retrieve some information. This is going beyond that to not just looking at some websites to or, or all those areas where it can get to in on the internet. It but it goes into you know all those documents that could be there. Every type of data that it can scan, it would scan to get you get back answers for you. Right, based on what you've asked for, it will try to present that data to you. So again, another interesting um, NLP startup, okay? Besides these startups, also want to talk to you about some interesting um, and amazing NLP examples. The first one being the Livox app, which is a communication device for people with disabilities, people who cannot speak, right? So it was a creation of a father who developed this help, uh, this app to help his non-verbal daughter um, who had a cerebral palsy uh, problem. And the customizable app is now available in 25 languages. Very creative, very innovative. Another innovative um, app here or the tool is the sign all that converts the sign language into text. How cool, right? Many of us see the you know people with, with sign languages. And sometimes if we don't know, we wonder, what are they talking about? What are they saying? And we could get into, they could get into situations or we could get into situations trying to understand what they're talking about. And, and, and I think this is a good tool that is going to help us, which will take, which will do all the, probably it does the object detection. And based on the object detection and, and the fingers being, and how the signs are being used, it is going to detect what the person is trying to see. Very cool, again, very innovative. The, the Google Translate, 
I, I don't think this needs any introduction. It's probably is there in, in everybody's phone these days, right? Um, I, again, a good app that has been around for a while. Um, so useful, especially if you are traveling abroad and going to places where the, the native language is not known to you or you don't know. This could be a very, very handy app where you know it, it is going to help you translate um, so many different languages in such a quick time. So another innovative um, you know an app here. And then there's the um, the the tool for and, and uh, for aircraft maintenance. So as you know, you know we could when the uh, aircraft is in the air the and it's being you know flown and if it gets into situations, they would call the control tower and the person who is answering this call has to really know all about the different types of airplanes. There are hundreds of different types of planes and all of that. And, and they need some help. And, and they need help at, you know, as, as you know, sometimes you're getting into those emergency situations, they need help right away. They can't be waiting for someone to go back and, and read through the manuals and come back and, and answer you. Maybe everything could be over by then, especially in, in, a, in a grave emergency situations. What if there's all this information about all these different types of aircraft is built into a corpus and, and it, it can answer any question for any type of aircraft, right? So, so that someone makes a phone call and, and it needs some urgent answers, it could get it, right? Based on it's it's going to read through all the different manuals and everything in there, and they're going to get the answer that they need um, at the end minute. So again, a, a wonderful app and a tool that is being used in in the um, you know uh, by many aircraft companies, many airlines. Sorry, and then the the predictive police work, which when I read for the first time, I was really surprised that there are already multiple states like. California and Washington and South Carolina and Alabama, Arizona, Tennessee, New York and I Illinois that used predictive policing, which means that based on certain events happening, it could predict a uh, certain type of crimes that could occur or the probability of certain types of crimes that could occur. How cool is that? Very, very, I think that's very creative, very innovative. But, and it's already been applied in all these states. I, it was amazing. I was really surprised. I said, wow, this has already been done. And we may be thinking that, you know, maybe it, it could be done in future. The future is here. It's already being used by multiple states. And who knows by this time, there are many more to this list that I don't have it here. So, you know, keep track. Maybe there's a Wikipedia site there and I provided a link there. See how many more that could have been added by now. Okay, so any any questions? Okay, I'll take that as no. So before I move on to talking about your you know assignment one, just wanted to touch upon this couple of things. One is about the biases, right? We we talked about different types of biases. I'm not going to go into details, but you you've addressed it. You you've done a lot of research. You came up with a lot of interesting discussion post and uh, you had a lot of chatter, a lot of discussion that happened. So we saw, you know, we talked about gender bias when it comes to cooking. You think about uh, a, a woman versus man or chef means uh, uh, the man versus woman. So there's all different types of gender bias that occurs in whether it's cooking, when you talk about STEM, like, you know, science and technology, um, with a security guard and handyman. That's, this is where all the different gender biases. The same with, you know, there's a bias for minorities and majority. When you talk about, you know, when there's a discussion about immigration or jobs or for travel or for business, you've seen the, the, the bias of minorities and, and majorities. There are also other kind of biases, you know, the height bias, like, you know, some tall people are preferred for certain jobs weight, you know, uh, where people, you know, there's a lot of bo body shaming that happens or, you know, the the um, the urge to get into um, the low weight, you know, being that low, you know, smaller frame, um, all, all of that, there's so much of bias uh, for, uh, uh, for that as well, for profession, for status, and the list can go on and on and on. How would you eliminate bias, right? Would you just go out, look for 
all the um, features in your data that you know ref are, that relate to you know some kind of a gender or uh, that kind of uh, represents or there's a representation of a minority or a majority those features are available in your data would you just remove it from there let me ask you guys what do you guys think if you if you have to think about all these biases and manage the bias what would you do would you just go out and just remove the gender from your data remove any minority or majority flag from your data remove any other bias that could be there in your data just go ahead and remove it maybe not because it depends on what you're trying to um, analyze what are you trying to build here as a model uh, it would depend a lot like for example if you're building if you're just trying to analyze hey how many what what type of students really um, took this degree course right took this data science degree course we want to know how many women did and versus how many men did right or how many males did how many females did would you just go out and and just remove the the gender flag from this data maybe not right because your analysis analysis is probably for something else maybe you just want to know maybe just on reporting purposes or maybe it's just kind of building some kind of a, a model that's really not going to be biased in any way but more of an eye opener maybe for awareness sake so you have to take a call based on that as to whether you would want to remove it, whether you would want to augment additional data. Again, augmenting could also lead to issues like, you know, you are probably feeding data that is not realistic. Like some of you talked about, hey, we can go and, and augment data that is going to say if there's a lot of data about a particular gender, we could have data about the other gender fed into this uh, data. But is it like, are you feeding something that could be non-real, unrealistic? You may not want to do that, right? So one of the ways, the other ways to kind of eliminate bias is, is break the stereotypes. Like, you know, having, you know, people and, and different types of people getting into different, you know, whether it's it's the type of job or a role or whatever it could be, you could be, you know, going into into and, and playing those roles and seeing that over time, when you break those stereotypes and different types of people are doing different things, over time, you're going to build data that is going to start mitigating and reducing bias over time. That's one way of doing it, right? But you cannot just change the world, right? Just because you have a data set with bias, some, you know, information in there, you just don't want to say, okay, when, when uh, you know, there's going to be, uh, no gender bias in this data. I'm going to do this modeling, right? You're not going to wait for that many years to to do your analysis. You probably still have to do that. But what I'm saying is is that maybe you want to just have that encouragement for you know breaking stereotypes and and making sure that what type of analysis just go don't go and blindly remove certain types of data just because you have to, right? Just because you want to eliminate bias. So one of the things you can do is, is this, what this risk management framework is telling you, uh, which is, I, I like this, this particular framework, which says, first map all those areas, all that context, um, which is going to lead to any kind of risk or any kind of a bias, just map them out, then measure what is the risk, uh, you know, based on that, analyze them, track them, whether this is something that's going to really hurt your modeling, your decision making, what kind of risk is involved with the type of data that you have, and then manage that, right? Whether you know you prioritize the risk and you try to eliminate that risk, you know, step by step, so that you can build a system that is going to be safe, ensure that your system is secure and resilient, robust. It's explainable. Every every output, every you know, um, any kind of output that you get out of the system is going to be explainable and anybody can interpret that. Um, you are going to ensure that you're going to have a, the privacy maintained. It's going to be fair with harmful bias managed and you're going to ensure there's accountability and transparency in the system so that you make your system trustworthy, valid and, and reliable, okay? So if you get a chance, I put in the source there, 
try to read more into this. Uh, it, it, it's it's a very good um, you know framework that I think we all should really uh, learn and talk about. So not done justice like by talking about it in just a few minutes here. So please, I would encourage you all to take a look into this and 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 read through this particular framework. And at the end, I would say there's some popular uh, NLP tools um, that you uh, you know that are available on many different platforms in cloud platforms and in other other platforms as well. Like on AWS, you have AWS Comprehend. For Azure, you have Azure Cognitive Services. For uh, for Google pl Computing Platform, you have NLP API. On IBM, there's IBM Watson. Monkey Learn is is is, is just a system. Um, it's an app uh, that you can, and there's a nice NLP platform there, but it's very popular. Alien is another popular platform, just got the SaaS API uh, for NLP. And Python, of course, everybody knows these classic um, you know, packages like NL NLTK, Spacey, and, and Gensim. So, so some of the, the popular NLP tools that are out there. And food for thought, which I would tell you almost every after every module, um, how would you take your learning about NLP forward? Like based on what you've been doing, what are what are some of the things you're going to do to take this forward? What is your plan to practice the knowledge and skills you have learned during this week? And have you researched areas to find text data sets for practicing your skills? So start thinking about this, right? Every module that you learn or certain types of, uh, you gain certain type of knowledge or skill set, just start you know, addressing some of the questions like this, okay? All right, um, any questions on NLP before I go and talk about the assignment one? I know we are like eight minutes away for the bottom of the hour. I may need probably a few more minutes. I hope you're all able to stay as we go through assignment one. But if no questions, then we could probably be done in another eight minutes for sure, okay? All right, so what's assignment one about? It's you'll be using AWS Academy Learning Lab for this assignment. So based on the assumption, I hope you all in the, in, uh, who are attending today as well as you know, watching this recording have an a, a Academy Learning Lab. You know, you've got the access to it. I send the email out. I know many of you had already gained access to it. Some, there are few who have not yet gained access to it. So please do not wait until next Tuesday to get access and start your assignment then. It's probably going to be too late. So as soon as, uh, you know, uh, uh, if, if you're not done this, as soon as this session ends, you may want to try that. And uh, folks who are going to be watching, you know, make sure that you have access to the lab. There are two Python notebook files and also a template that is given to you to capture responses to complete the assignment. For all the questions that are asked, there is already a document, which is a, a template document for you. It's like an answer sheet that's been provided to you. Um, what you have to do is, is execute two notebook files, two, two Python notebook files that have been provided to you. Exercise one, part A, and exercise one, um, you know, part B. And point allocation is also provided in detail in the rubric. So there are two notebooks. Um, there's exercise one, part one, which is text cleaning and not, so not part A, but part one, which is text cleaning and processing methods. And there's exercise one, part two, which is vectorization methods, the bag of words and TFIDF, okay? And this is the rubric here, where the rubric, you see all the different points that have been allocated first and foremost. You're going to demonstrate that the exercise part one notebook was run in SageMaker. So you will have to demonstrate and show that you're running this, in, you're in the lab, in the AWS lab, and you are already running this uh, file there, this particular notebook. You discuss the results with a new sentence, so there's already an, an, um, a sample given, an example with a sentence. You would have to then provide your own sentence and run the analysis on it and, and talk about it. You then discuss the purpose of the notebook and you explain each code chunk. 
We explain the purpose of stop word list and how stop word lists are generally used. You demonstrate how the part two notebook was successfully uploaded and run. You also you know, write a description of what the notebook does. You get, so there are multiple points for that. And you address questions about vectorization and encoding. So if you if you downloaded this assignment file, I would say download it again before every assignment. There was an, uh, a minor update here. And the update was that you probably just need two methods. Even if the the uh, you know, example says that you have to have three methods uh, to be discussed of uh, the vectorization method, I would say two suffices. If you can, if you can describe bag of words and TF IDF, that would be more than enough. Okay. And um, deallocate resources and end the lab. Very important step, guys. And please do not miss out or skip this step here. Very important. And I would be really looking for an a proof of that you de deallocate the resources. There are been, you know, uh, uh, situations where a couple of students in the past have gone over and used the entire credit, and it's such a huge task, and it's very difficult to provide another account to build another account at that point. So again, you cannot; it's not as easy as just going and and resetting your credit uh, for the lab. Once the credit is gone, it, it's it's a huge step and a process to get you, you know, a, another account. So please, it's very important that you, do, you deallocate all the resources that you, that you build. And, and the, the document, the assignment will tell you step-by-step -step instructions on how you deallocate the resources, okay? All right, so that's pretty much what the assignment is, is about. Any questions? I have a question. Um... Mm -hmm. So you said for assignment one, we have to upload two, two, two things, right? So the assignment has two files, Python files that are given to you that you need to execute on SageMaker. Okay. okay. And then based on when you execute this, there are questions asked on, on on what you, the output that you get for when you execute these two files. That has to be captured in a template file. There's a template answer sheet that has been given to you. You need to take that answer sheet and you need to record your answers there. And all the other answers, questions that are asked, you need to kind of provide the answers for those questions. Does that help, Preeti? Yes, yes. Okay, good. I have a question. Sure. Um, in the same part where it talks about the encoding methods, it also mentions uh, the two-day arrays. Can you talk more about like the document for matrix? The document for matrix. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to... What was that again? Sorry, uh, sorry. In the document, it's like the second sentence down on the one right before the deallocation resource end lab. Uh huh. Uh, it says it's also known as a document term matrix. I, oh, I'm just DTM. Talking. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that since I'm not familiar with it? Oh, it, it's like building a, a matrix of the of the word frequency. Like it, it's the document term matrix, which is basically putting up the how many, like simply putting like how many documents have a certain term. Like let's say you have a word, right? Let's say you have a word called question and how many documents, which document have this particular word and how many times it is repeated. It builds a whole matrix taking into consideration all documents, all the terms and how many times each of these documents carry this word. That's what that kind of a matrix it builds. Is that one of the reasons that we remove the uh, stop word so that we don't have so much high, like high counts in that? Yeah, and, and sometimes these stop words, they really are not helping you with the analysis. They may not, because these are the words that, um, like, uh, you know, they may be used so often that it may skew your result or analysis just because of the fact that they are used, uh, you know, most commonly and, 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 and multiple times. Thank you. Mm-hmm.
good question there. Any other questions? Okay, is everybody good with NLP and with assignment one? Okay, any other questions besides NLP, assignment one, any course related question? I'll take silence as no. If not, we can call it a wrap. Wasn't too bad. We just went a minute over. But thank you all um, for attending. I will be posting the recording in the classroom as soon as I, I get it from the cloud. But thank you all and good night. And see you in two weeks time for a module two webinar. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.